Um, so our next speaker uh, is Maria Gornova, uh, who's contributed a talk on efficient inference with discrete parameters in STAN. Hello. Okay, hope uh, you can hear me. Uh, let me share screen. And uh, I will show up and give you a warning. You have uh, Sorry, this is uh, for some reason being dodgy. Hmm. Okay. Does this work? Looks good. Mm. Uh, uh, we were able right. to your slides a minute ago. Okay, I think I think this should be ah there we go. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, hello everybody. Uh, nice. It's firstly it's really nice to be here. I like, thank you so much for uh, organizing Prof. Pro, uh, again. It's it was my favorite conference two years ago when it happened for the first time, uh, and I'm really excited it's happening again. I'm very excited to be here. Um, Okay, so today I'm, I'm going to be talking about um, some research that it really started from the question of um, how can we use problem transformations to um, make to make programs, um, progressive programs, um, somehow more efficient to do uh, discrete uh, to do inference in uh, programs with discrete and continuous parameters simultaneously, and in um, and in particular how to do that in STAN. But obviously. A long time has passed since January when we submitted the abstract uh, for this talk. So um, it kind of it, it grew to something that, in my opinion, uh, can be applied to even even more generally than that. And hopefully there will be time at the end to discuss this briefly. All right. So um, I'm not going to spend much time introducing Stan. Um, I suppose most people uh, have heard of it in the audience. It's uh, one of the popular progressive programming languages out there uh, and has uh, amazing uh, community um, and lots of support for all sorts of cool stuff. And partially um, what makes Stan uh, popular is uh, the um, uh, efficient MCMC algorithm it, it uses. Um, uh, which is a dynamic version of HMC, and um, this this um, algorithm uses the gradient of the joint um, uh, density described by the model in order to uh, make inference more efficient. Um, but now here you can immediately probably see that uh, this restricts right away the models we can express uh, in Stan and we can work with Stan um, because we we need in order to be able to take the gradient of this joint density we needed to be piecewise differentiable um, and the immediate problem here is that this means that the parameters theta uh, cannot be discrete otherwise we can't take that gradient but there exists a workaround and this workaround is um, you know it's well known it's uh, documented a lot in the stand user um, guide and so on where um, you as a user can use discrete um, parameters in STAN kind of um, implicitly by marginalizing them out um, uh, of your program. And you can probably see uh, where I'm going with this, uh, which is that for this work, we decided we want to take um, a program that is uh, a STAN program, but with discrete parameters and automatically apply this workaround in order to get regular stand that we can then run HMC on. Um, right, and a, a side note here, actually in, in this talk, um, uh, the other examples are not in stand, but in slick stand, um, which is this blockless, more compositional version of stand that um, uh, we developed a couple of years ago, and it was actually presented, presented at the previous proc proc. 
So, um, enough of this high level stuff. Let's just dive into an example um, of how we can how we can take a program with a discrete parameter and transform it using this workaround. Um, here we have a simple change point model where we are interested in modeling the point of change of um, the, rate, the rate that certain event occurs at. So say that we have um, say that we have data uh, uh, an array of um, data y where um, for we record the number of occurrences of certain events, say disasters, um, for each of many years of t years. Um, so you can imagine, like depending on what we count as a disaster, that 2020 is like one gazillion disasters or something. Um, and now we we are going to model the number of um, disasters that appeared at year t as following a Poisson distribution where the rate of this Poisson distribution is either E or L, depending on is this year T before or after the change point D. And D itself is a discrete parameter that we're interested in, um, together with E and L, which are, uh, which are continuous parameters. Okay, so this program we can't have in STAN, at least not written like that because of this discrete parameter. Um, but really we can, we, we can rewrite it in the following way. So firstly, what this, th this program corresponds to a joint density. And this joint density is on, um, on the data Y, on the continuous parameter ENL, a parameter CNL, and the discrete parameter D. Um, and it can be written as this. Now to marginalize out D, we simply put uh, a sum in front of in front of this expression, so we sum over all possible values that D can take, which is from one to T, um, and that's it. And the way we're going to express this uh, in in terms of the program is quite straightforward. Um, we're just going to wrap the program into a for loop, where we're going to loop over possible values for D, and kind of record record this value uh, at, um, at the particular EL and Y um, in some array ACC uh, indexed by, by the value that D takes. So, so this really, this body of, of the loop, of the for loop, corresponds to this bit, the inner bit of the sum. And then all we have to do once we compute this is that we're going to add an undirected factor, and this is the way uh, we add an undirected factor um, in stan slash slick stan, um, which sums over the the values uh, the, over the array ACC. Okay, and I mean here you you can see like tiny bits such as um, oh well like these two these two factors P and PL don't really depend on these, so we can take them out of the sum. Um, so, oops. So yeah, so we can do that um, by just pushing some some of the statements outside and, and stuff like that. So okay, we can do tiny optimizations like that. Um, so this is the the overall picture on the same slide. We started from this program, which has a discrete parameter, and it uh, defines the the density over y, e, l, and d. Then we summed out D from, from this by just having a simple for loop. Um, and then the interesting bit here is that this ACC actually um, contains an unnormalized version of the probability of D given the rest of the, the variables. Um, so we can, we can normalize this and actually then um, use a simple random number generator to sample D again. So not only um, we, so, okay, so what we, we managed to do here is that we marginalized out D. So now we can plug in this bit of the program into HMC to sample E and L given the data Y. 
And now that we've done that, we also have computed this ACC array that allows us to then resample the um, given this um, information afterwards. Um, so that seems, you know, relatively straightforward. Um, all we have to do is just wrap our entire program into arrays. That's it. Like, whatever. But will that work? What if we have more variables? So more discrete variables. So for every discrete variable, we will have to put an extra sum, right? We will have some per variable. So this means one that our this array ACC where we would accumulate things um, is n-dimensional, and two, we're going to have n-listed for loops. So obviously this doesn't scale. Um, but and, and it's, it's not going to scale in the in the general in the general case. Like if we if we take a general graph, it's it's not going to it, it's not going to work. But for many problems in uh, practice, we have kind of loosely dependent structure um, of, of variables. So one very famous example is uh, uh, hidden Markov models, where each variable only depends um, on the on the previous and the next variable, or is only connected to the previous and the, the next variable in the chain. And in situations like that, we can actually do the sums in pairs. And by doing them, so taking taking here just the um, the last and the second to last variables, and kind of doing this bit of the computation first, and then propagating this. So by doing this pairing and computing it separately, um, we can actually make this much more efficient. And instead of so here we had n nested for loops, well here we can have n two nested for loops. So they're, they're going to be like pairs of two nested for loops and, and, and of those um, right after uh, the other. Um, okay, so there is actually a general way of doing this. And this general way is um, nothing new. Again, very well known algorithm called variable elimination. Um, and this, I mean, I'm just going to go quickly through it so we're on the same page. Um, it's quite simple. It's We have a factor graph that represents our program like that. Um, and then in order to eliminate one of the variables, say z1, what we're going to do is we're just going to take z1, we're going to take all the factors that neighbor um, z1, we're going to remove them from the graph, and instead we're going to add a new factor that is the sum over Z1 uh, of the product of these three previous factors that we had here, right? So this is this is their product. And we're going to connect this new factor to, to whatever neighbors Z1 had. And that's it. And now Z1 is eliminated from this graph. Um, and we can do this because we know that all these other factors don't depend on Z1. Um, and now if we want to eliminate Z2, we do the same thing. We take Z2, we take all the neighboring factors, we sum them out, and we add a new factor um, representing this. Okay, so, so what's the problem? I mean, <laughs> right, so the transformation is quite simple. We just like sum out variables from the problem with four loops. The algorithm for doing this efficiently is quite simple. It's just variable elimination. It has been known for ages, nothing new. But what it requires is that we need to, so in, in all of that, we had an explicit factor graph and we knew exactly what these factors are and we can play with them, uh, with them. we can recompute them, we can compute new factors and so on. Um, well, when we have a pro program, things are not that obvious. So going back to the change point model, if we just add a couple of, you know, nonsense um, lines here, um, suddenly the factors that neighbor our discrete variable D are scattered around. So here we have A that's computed from D, and then we use A in the uh, likelihood uh, term. Mm, but then there is some other expressions in the middle that completely don't depend on this. So how do we 
given that we want to rewrite the program, how do we efficiently, one, figure out what, which discrete variable depends on which discrete variable, and two, figure out what statements we should separate out in order, and put them into their respective for loops um, in order to do this, uh, this marginalization efficiently and correctly. And that brings me to the, the key idea uh, of our work, which was to, um, so it, it, it has two stages. One is to use information for analysis and type inference to analyze the conditional independence relationships in the program. So kind of analyze, uh, analyze this, oops, this and figure out that uh, here Z3 is conditionally independent on Z1 given Z2, for example. Um, so that kind of uh, relationships. And then using those conditional independence relationships um, and kind of assigning uh, assigning a, a something to each variable in the program, we can actually slice our program into several different uh, sections and so that we can reorganize it to do this um, marginalization efficiently. And I think I have a little bit of time to go into this Just slightly. Just a couple minutes, uh, but yes. Okay, awesome. So um, I don't need more than a couple uh, than me, so that, that's perfect. So roughly how this works, and if you're interested in more details, please come to the poster session later. Um, lovely, uh, roughly how it works is that we are going to assign um, level types to each, um, each of our each, each variable in our program. So what's that? So in information flow, we want to analyze how the, the information flows within the program between variables. So these level types, they kind of say um, what, they kind of express this hierarchy in, in our program. Um, and we have three of them here, and they form a, what's called a semi-lattice, where um, there is a relationship defined between L1 and L2 and L1 and L3, but there isn't any between L2 uh, and L3, right? So what, what this means is that when we, um, by assigning particular uh, types to uh, variables in our program and then inferring the rest of those types of, this, uh, of these level types, we can actually separate out statement, groups of statements that don't depend on, on other groups of statements. So all we're going to do here is that we're going to say that all our continuous parameters in the program are of level L1. And we're going to say that the variable that we want to eliminate is of level uh, L2. Now we infer all the other types uh, in the program. So, you know, like if we have a complicated program, uh, maybe I should show this one. If we have a, a program like that, we're going to, for example, we're going to infer that the type of, of uh, the variable A is uh, L2 because it depends on D, which is L2. So the information kind of like flows in that direction. So we know that it's L2. So this, is, this is roughly the idea. Um, and now having done that, we can slice the program based on these three levels. And what we're going to get is three bits of program. So it's here S1, S2, and S3 are just bits of program, such that this bit of program it is completely separated from this bit of program. Uh, and that's again because there is no relationship defined between the L2 and the L3 variables, so they're completely separated through L1. In other words, the L3 variables are conditionally independent on the L2 variables given the L1 variables. And expressing it as a factor graph like that is very clear how we're going to, what we have to do to eliminate um, X. Uh, XL2, which is what we set to our discrete parameter of, of choice. Uh, we just have to do variable elimination on this bit, right? So we, need, we, we know which bit of program to plug there. Um, and that allows us to, do, to, to deal with uh, um, programs with more complicated control flow um, and so on. 
So uh, yeah, I, we uh, can talk uh, more about this at the poster session, uh, but for now, I am happy to take uh, any questions. And also uh, just quick mention, uh, the paper describing this is now on archive. It's called Conditional Independence by Typing. Please check it out if you're interested. And also Slickstan is finally open source. So please also check this out. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you for the wonderful talk. Um, uh, one question uh, uh, with a lot of votes from the audience is, have you considered discrete random, random variables with infinite support? And I'd be interested in hearing either or both your perspective on their utility uh, in this setting and also uh, the technical challenges involved in supporting them. Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, uh, thank you for whoever asked that. Yes, uh, we cannot do uh, discrete variables with infinite support um, this way. Um, there might be some way to do it approximately, but we haven't really looked into this. Um, the yeah, the, the ways described right now, uh, we can't do it. But all the conditional independence uh, stuff still works, right? So ah, that's actually relating to what I said in the beginning. This conditional independence relationship and ways of um, determining conditional independence, that is the more general conclusion we reach that um, actually we can take that and use it for many applications. It doesn't have to be these discrete variable elimination um, things. So that's that's fine. But yeah, the elimination doesn't work with influence support. Thank you again. Um, I, thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you.